Welcome everyone to Mount Calvary Lutheran Church here on this first Sunday of Lent. And as we enter the season of Lent, I have a question for you. How will the season of Lent be different for you? What changes in your spiritual life is God leading you to? Uh, we'll be talking about that this Sunday as we enter this very special season of the church. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the season of Lent that brings us back to reality, to shows us our sin and how often we can slowly fall away from our faith. Use this season to bring us closer to Jesus, our Savior. Amen. stand for our opening of our first Lenten worship service. We begin this sacred season in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you will forgive the guilt of my sin. We take a moment of silent confession. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Hear now the good news. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this day, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, announce that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As part of a loved community on a Lenten journey, extend God's love to the people around you, online or in person. Who 
am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes, I am. last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh is free I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I. a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Today's faith talk is about one of the special ministries here at Mount Calvary, and that is our prayer ministry. Uh, here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Mount Calvary has a very powerful prayer ministry going on that you might need. You might need somebody to pray for you or a friend or a neighbor. And so we encourage you, if that is the case, that you would call the church or email the church and put your prayer requests on our prayer chain. And that prayer chain will go to lots of other people who will pray and email is sent out to pray for circumstances. And that is part of our prayer ministry. Every Monday for one hour from 12.30 to 1.30, we have a team that gets together in the back of the church and we pray for the needs of the congregation. Uh, every Saturday night or Sunday, we have little prayer cards and people fill them out and we pass those to the prayer team and they pray a lot on Monday. And then many of those are taken home by different prayer warriors that are there, and they continue there to be in prayer. And then in the worship service, there's a time during our prayers, again, which is important, where we encourage you to pray for someone. And I'd like you to take that very seriously. When I say it's time for you to pray for someone, see who comes into your mind. Is it a friend, a neighbor, uh, a fellow Christian? and then spend that time praying for that person. God has laid upon your heart that person. And so when that person comes to your mind, a face, an idea, start praying for them. And uh, one of the ways we want to extend our prayer ministry here at Mount Calvary is we set up a booth at the local farmer's market in Running Springs. And we just got a big old sign that says, need prayer, come over here. And we're gonna have prayer teams there several times a month where anybody go into the farmer's market and come and just have somebody pray for them. So prayer is important. Prayer does change things. And if you'd like to be part of our prayer ministry here at Mount Calvary, let us know. 
We can put you on the prayer chain. You can get the prayer emails. Uh, we'll let you know about the Monday prayer group or if you want to be praying with others at the farmer's market, we can sign you up for that. So this is just one part of our many ministries here at Mount Calvary, our prayer ministry. Our first lessons from Romans chapter nine. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursue it not by faith, but as if it was by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Here ends our first lesson. Our gospel reading for this day is taken from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. Here ends our gospel lesson. Now with our fellow Christ followers around the world, we confess our common faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Lord, I stand at the edge of the wilderness of temptation, congratulating myself for resisting that big sin, then cower in shame because I had a weak moment. Peering through the darkness, I see you alone, in a wilderness I can't even fathom. On your knees, praying to your Father as the devil tempts you and tries to destroy you. With one crushing blow, you could end him. But you choose what the Father has before you, to be human for our sakes. You choose to walk the dark wilderness for 40 days, all for our sakes. So we know that we can too, with your help. Help me see through the darkness, your light waiting for me. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You might notice I'm not preaching from the chapel today. I'm preaching from my house. Uh, we're having a very large snowstorm and I can't make it to church today. So let's get into God's word here as we continue our sermon series on the book of Romans. And today, as we do our sermon series on Romans, we're going to take a little break because we've been learning lots of good theology, but good theology needs to be put into practice. Uh, we're to put our passion into practice. 
Reminds me of a, a joke I read this week. Uh, Jesus gathered with his disciples and said, help your neighbor, take care of the poor and the helpless. To which one of the disciples said, but Jesus, can't we just give our money to the Romans and let them do it for us? And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to start over from the beginning. Let me know where I lost you. That our faith, our theology, we are to put into practice on a daily basis. And so good theology leads us to caring for our neighbor. And so who is our neighbor? And Jesus, uh, back in uh, Luke chapter 10, told this story. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus said. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And so we're going to take our theology and then ask our question, who is my neighbor? Reminds me of a Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? And that is a good way for us to think, who is my neighbor and won't you be my neighbor? And we know that this story comes from that famous story of the Good Samaritan. A guy was on his way to Jericho. He is robbed and left by the side of the road. And different religious people come by and see him there and do nothing. They didn't mix their theology with their actions. But along came a Samaritan. And the Samaritan stops. And the Samaritan helps. He had better theology than the Jewish leaders that passed this man by. And then Jesus ended that little parable with these words. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So let's dig into this idea that we worship a God who teaches us that he is full of justice and compassion. Reminds me of Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9. The Lord is loving and merciful, slow to become anger, full of constant love. He is good to everyone and has compassion on all he has made. And look at that word compassion. It's a very interesting word. Uh, it means going beyond just helping to feeling the pain of others. It literally means to suffer with. Our God feels our pain in his gut and we feel the pain of others in our gut. And there's an interesting Greek word for compassion. You can see it there on the slide. Uh, it's a word that refers to the inner parts of a person, the heart, the liver, and so on. Sometimes a sharp pain in the abdomen will accompany intense feelings of compassion and pity for those we love. And so when our children get hurt, we feel this ache inside of ourselves. We hate to feel them in pain. Uh, when we see our neighbor in need, often we feel this ache inside of us. And that is what good theology is to bring to us. And that's why the Samaritan stopped. He stopped because he had this feeling in his gut. I need to do something. I need to help this man. This man is my neighbor. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to build in you. The ability to suffer with others when they are suffering. Uh, we are starting a new grief ministry in the first Thursday of March. And to be a leader of grief ministry means a lot of sorrow, a lot of hurting on your heart because you enter into these other people's pain and suffering. And that is what God calls us to do, to enter into other people's pain and suffering. A big part of a pastor's job is to walk with people in the midst of their sorrows. And so pretty much every week I talk to people who've suffered a loss and I say these words, tell me the story. Tell me the story of your loss. Tell me the story of the person that you love that is no longer with you. Because in them telling the story, they find a little bit of healing. But that means I must enter into their sufferings. And so God instructed the Hebrews to be people of compassion with a gut feeling to those in need. Uh, Deuteronomy 24. 
When you're harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheep, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, the widow, so the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. We are to have compassion on people in need. And there's a whole book of the Bible about that called Ruth. And Ruth was a woman who married a young man whose mom was Naomi. And Ruth's husband died, Naomi's husband died, and they are left together. And in this beautiful story, we see Ruth having gut compassion for Naomi. Listen to Ruth chapter 1. But Ruth answered, Do not ask me to leave you. Let me go with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. That is where I will be buried. May the Lord's worst punishment come upon me if I let anything but death separate you from me. Ruth had good theology. She suffered with Naomi and cared for Naomi. Uh, as one author said, compassion goes beyond just helping. It's the feeling of pain of others. It literally means to suffer with. God feels our pain in his gut, and we feel the pain of others in our gut. And again, I see this with our food ministry. As people come in for food, we see them as people, and we hear their stories, and we feel compassion for them in our gut. And that's what Jesus taught us to do. Jesus gathered people around him to point to himself as a savior of the world, but also to equip them to help other people. I have this great quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Those who are not happy look for happiness are those most likely to find it because those who are searching forget that the surest way to be happy is to seek happiness for others. And so we are blessed as we feel this pain and enter into other people's lives to care for them. Uh, I made this life point many years ago, helpers are happier. And I've talked about this research team from Missouri, Columbia, that suggests that Martin Luther King's words, which are based upon Jesus so long ago, influence our lives, that our own happiness is in large part influenced by the kindness and generosity we show to others. Listen to what the study said. The researcher squares with other studies showing how spending money on others increases one happiness more than spending money on oneself. But it's not just financial generosity that has power to increase our happiness. Donating our time to someone in need or simply adopting a mentality that puts others' happiness above our own has a positive impact on our psychological well-being. And so we in America talk about the pursuit of happiness, but we'd be much better off pursuing happiness for others because that is where we find joy, and that is one of the secrets that Jesus taught. And so who had the real joy that day in the story of the Good Samaritan? Uh, the two religious leaders missed out on joy, the joy of helping others. The Good Samaritan left that day with joy. He had done what he could for his neighbor. And so we look to Jesus as our model of compassion. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease. Imagine the joy Jesus had that day. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And so as we read the Gospels, we see Jesus' gut compassion for others, Stopping to help a woman whose daughter has died. Stopping to help a person being lowered by his friends through a roof to be healed. Stopping with a woman at the well who's been rejected by everyone else. And so this is what we're to do with our theology, to mix it with compassion, to help other people. We take our theology and we serve. And at church, we're going through the different ministry teams. And I talked about our Mercy Ministry Team, a group that feeds people food, others who write notes to people and call people, others who visit people, uh, others who 
just get involved in other people's lives. The Mercy Ministry team knows that as they do these things, they all have joy. Maybe you're to be part of the Mercy Ministry. I talked about our prayer team and all the prayers that they do. Maybe you need to be part of a prayer team and again, feel that joy of service. Next week, I'll talk about our children's ministry team. Maybe God is calling you to hang out with kids and to be a teacher to them. And so who is our neighbor? It is anyone we see in need. And we now live our, out our theology in caring for our neighbor and in serving our neighbor. And we do this because Jesus has that compassion for us. Jesus is our good Samaritan. You see, Jesus was like that Samaritan, but we were the ones by the side of the road. We have been beat up and robbed by Satan and the evil of this world. We are helpless sinners. Uh, one author said, The law of God makes demands which we could not, cannot, and never will fulfill. Uh, Romans 3.10, No one is righteous, no, not even one. Isaiah 46, even our filthy deeds are as filthy rags. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And so there we are on the side of the road, powerless to help ourselves, powerless to get into the presence of God. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes and becomes our good Samaritan. He stops and he rescues us. This is the gospel message. And I was at a conference today where a lot of churches try to force people into church. They try to use the law to make people into Christians. And the law is just there to show us our sins. It is the gospel that brings us to faith. The gospel makes no demands and even gives the faith we need to believe in. And so allow Jesus to get his gospel message into you to let you know that he sees you and your problems and he forgives you and that Christ was slain before the foundations of the world for you, that Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament for you, that Christ was conceived and born the Virgin Mary for you, that Christ suffered and died for you, and that Christ rose again for you. Jesus, our good Samaritan, stopped and rescued us. This is the gospel message. And now we are to take this gospel message and apply it to our lives. Back to Luke chapter 10. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor, the man who fell among the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy upon him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And so if we are to show compassion to people as God does, we're going to have to change sometimes our priorities and how we use our time. We're going to have less time for ourselves and less money for ourselves, and uh, be a lot more tired than what we want to be. But in that tiredness, in that service is joy. And again, think about those other two people in that story. The priest happened to be going down the road and he saw them and he passed by on the other side. And so to the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. We are not to pass by on the other side. We are to stop and help our neighbor. And we are to see that everyone we meet is our neighbor. Even if they have a different political viewpoint than us, they are our neighbor. Even if they live in a way that we do not agree with, they're still our neighbor. Even though they might be old and hard to understand, they're our neighbor. Or it might be a child who is very rambunctious. That child is your neighbor. And so we're to stop and help. And sometimes the help is money, but more importantly, the help needs to be ourselves. And so as we're going through Romans, we take this break. We're learning good theology, but we need to put our theology into practice. We're to love with abundance. And that's what our worship video is about, how we are to be people who love abundantly because God has loved us. There's one day of the year when love is celebrated in abundance. Big red hearts passed to all of our friends, bags of the best chocolate consumed by the pound, 
cards, candy, nice meals, surprise gifts. It's lavish and lovely and reminds us of all the good things. But what does love look like when it spills to every other day of the year? Maybe it's food banks always stocked, hard conversations over hot cups of coffee, holding the hand of a stranger, sticking it out through hard times, sitting in grief, it's not even yours, delivering hope through a simple card, laughter and goodwill, provision, protection, patience, forgiveness before it's asked, walking a mile in another's shoes. We know this kind of love because we saw it. Love is the Son willing to hang on the cross, the God willing to die in our place, the Father who had a plan to save His children from the moment He created us. We were always on His heart and still are every day of the year. So who is my neighbor? Jesus said, go and do likewise as the Good Samaritan. And so I believe that God calls us Christians to show compassion, to show this deep care for people in need. And why do we do that? Because of all that God has done for us. Let us pray. Lord God, on this snowy day, we pray your blessings upon us. Help us to look around the room that we are in, to look at our phone, to look out the window and see all around us are our neighbors. And we are to put our theology into practice. We are to care for them and love them the way you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, I encourage you to stand for this first season of prayer during this time of Lent. Lord God, we thank you for this special season that we have entered into a season of repentance, a season of purple, of thinking about our King suffering and dying for us. Bless us in this Lenten journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Help us to take this season seriously, to give up something that there might be more room for Jesus in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Be with those who are sick and ill on their Lenten journey. We pray for healing upon them. Be with Melissa and Debbie, Lynn, Pat, Judy, and Ruth. We ask your blessings upon them and healing upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Be with Kirk and Tony on their hospice journey. Give them hope in this difficult season of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Be with those who are grieving during their Lenten journey. Help them to find people to talk to and hope in the darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we pray once again for the end of this unjust war in Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord God, each of us gathered here this day know somebody who could use a prayer right now. During this time of silence, hear us as we pray for a friend, a neighbor, a fellow Christian in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So watch over us as we go through this journey. Let this next few weeks be special to us as we prepare for Holy Week. We ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Parish announcements. Uh, once again, if you'd like to join us for Bible study, uh, 4.30 on Zoom, you can join me with my small group Bible study. Or Sundays at 9.30, you can join a very large group of Christians who gather after the 8 o'clock worship service. Also, we encourage you to go on this Lenten journey that you will Set aside time each and every day for 
Bible reading, for prayer, and for random acts of kindness in serving other people. Uh, if you'd like to join us for our Lenten worship services, they'll be on Tuesdays at 6 o'clock uh, with a soup supper beforehand. It is now time to leave this special time of worship. Uh, receive God's blessings. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Um.